Welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. For those that don't know me, my name is Mario Flores. I'm the secretary for uh, AEC Hawaii section. Um, and today we have uh, a pretty exciting presentation. I'm looking forward to this one about the airport guideway and stations project uh, from Hart. So joining us today, uh, we have Mike Marquez. Uh, Mike grew up in Southern California, has been an engineer for 32 years. He was a senior bridge engineer for Caltrans before moving his family of four kids to Hawaii 16 years ago. Recently, for two and a half years, he was a lead engineer for Guideway and Stations before now being assigned as resident engineer for the entire AGS project. We also have Joel Thomas. Uh, Joel grew up on the Big Island and has lived on Oahu for the past 20 years. In his 15 years of construction management experience, Joel managed civil construction projects for HDOT, Department of Energy, City and County of Honolulu, and ENV. Joel joined Hart in 2016 as a change in claims engineer and lead office engineer. He is currently the lead engineer for stations on AGS. Ryan Morrissey is also joining us. Uh, Ryan is from Chicago, Illinois. His previous engineering roles have included bridge, highway, and building construction management, and also utility and highway signage and marking design. Ryan is currently the construction management lead for AGS structures, track work, and elevators. Uh, and also joining us is Nate Meddings. He's the project director here at Hart. Uh, I know he wanted to just say a few words before we kick off, so we'll let Nate uh, go ahead and take it away. All righty, thank you, Mario. Uh, I just wanted to extend our gratitude on behalf of the Hart Ohana for allowing our guys to get up and talk about um, one of our really successful design build contracts. Um, what I appreciate about professional groups like this is it brings people together um, kind of on the same side of the table to open up their minds and learn from each other. Whereas, you know, maybe down the road or even historically, we maybe have sat across the table from each other and, you know, had opposing views on things. So this is a really good collaborative opportunity to bring people together um, with kind of an unfiltered debrief of what's going on to ask questions and to learn from that. Um, What's very important to know about Heart is we are so focused on our reputation, our credibility. Um, we spent the last year and a half under our new executive director, Lori, Lori Kahikina, um, building that trust back into the community. Um, she personally goes to neighborhood boards to talk to 10, 15 people at a time. She's currently doing that right now, so she sends her apologies for not being able to make this group. But every person that we can reach out and um, shed light on our priorities as the new organization is so important. So we appreciate that time. We welcome questions and we'll all be here to the end to answer those. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Mike Marquez, I think, to start this out. Thank you, everyone. All right, thank you very much. Thank you AACE for inviting us and thank you Mario for facilitating this and uh, we're just excited to share. We, we love working on this project and we uh, love sharing that with you. All right, here's a, just an overview map of the entire uh, rail project. I just wanted to share just a <clears throat> The first half, the first uh, segment that has been constructed here is from East Kapolei all the way to Aloha Stadium. And then our project here, see in red, it starts from Aloha Stadium all the way to Middle Street. And then, and then the project continues all the way down to Ala Moana. And, all right. Okay, here's some facts about our, our contract. So the uh, contract was awarded to a joint venture of Shimerick Trailer and Granite Joint uh, Ventures. And the contract amount is 874,700, uh, I'm sorry, 874,750,000. And our contract uh, includes 5.2 miles of guideway, four stations, track work, utility relocations, and a lot of roadway improvements as well. Okay, here's an overview map of just our project, or we call the AGS uh, project, and that is, that is uh, airport, guideway, and stations. 
And again, like I mentioned, we start here at Aloha Stadium and we come down to the airport. We have a station at uh, Pearl Harbor Naval Base. We have one at the airport and one over here at Lagoon Drive and Middle Street Station. What I wanted to show you, what you see in different colors is that the project was broken down into five reaches. Reach A, B, C, D, and E. And so um, the way that it's, it's kind of kind of cool how we use three gantries to be able to complete the guideway. And that is because if you had one gantry, imagine 5.2 miles, it would take a while before you finish it. So we had one gantry work the A and B section, another gantry, the C section, and another gantry over an E. Okay, with that, I'll turn it over for stations to Joel. Excellent. Thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, so just uh, to start off, uh, there's just a couple general stations uh, items I was going to mention. So the station designs were uh, mostly driven by the functional requirements to bring transit pas passengers safely and efficiently from the station entrance to the platforms up above. Um, there we do have aesthetic columns at each of our stations, uh, including the ones on the west that Mike mentioned. Um, these columns depict the history and the stories of the local area that celebrate the past, while also acknowledging the present day existence uh, that surrounds each site. The uh, there's also native landscaping and plants that are, are placed strategically at each station that incorporate those values as well. Um, that said, yeah, we can move over to the next slide here. Um, going to Pearl Harbor, I believe. Mike, are you who's man in the uh, slides? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so. Makalapa station, so this is the first station on our alignment um, after the Aloha Stadium. And so Makalapa station is located on Kameme Highway near Radford Drive at the entrance of the naval base uh, at the Makalapa gate. So Pearl Harbor Naval Base uh, is designated as a natural historic landmark. So there were a lot of elements of the site characteristics that were incorporated into the station's design. The cultural theme of the station is Halava Ahu Pua. Um, and basically pr prior to Western influence, the area was centered around natural resources, specifically uh, loko ia, or fish ponds. So this concept was incorporated into the design of the station. Um, you can kind of see on the, the rendering on your right there, we have colored pavings uh, that represent the red soil of the land. Then you have the Halava stream that kind of runs through the middle there. Um, and the it's kind of hard to see, but the little uh, pavers that are installed in the front there represent the abundance of pee, pee or oysters that once flourished in the area. Um, other artistic or cultural elements also include, there is a camouflage CMU block ancillary building that houses our train access control rooms and electrical rooms and that sort of thing. Um, you can't really see it in either of these photos, uh, but if you do drive by this area, you can see it kind of back behind uh, that tree there that's in the upper left, um, or maybe you won't see it because it is camouflage. But uh, there's also a specialty handcrafted glass artwork that was placed on the concourse pedestrian bridge that's viewable both for passengers kind of walking through that that uh, concourse level and the motorist below can also see it. Um, so the general basic elements of the station. Uh, so there is one entrance to this passenger station uh, located on that Malka side of Kameme Highway there. And then once you go through the fare gates, uh, the passengers would then go either upstairs, an escalator or an elevator to the concourse or platform level. From the concourse level, there's a pedestrian bridge that provides safe passage across Kamehameha Highway, 
which uh, accesses both westbound and eastbound platforms. And from that concourse area, there's also elevator, escalator, and stairs that bring the passengers up to the top. Um, at the platform level, we use side platforms. So that allows um, basically you would, depending on which direction you're traveling, uh, the you would board either side and then board the trains which are traveling in right down the middle. Um, another thing worth noting at Makalapa Station was, you know, we do have the naval base that's kind of to your right uh, outside of that rendering photo on, on your right side. Uh, so due to kind of security concerns uh, on the Navy side, they asked that we install security screens um, basically at, at all areas that kind of front that side of the station. So we do have these uh, kind of like tall, extra tall security screen barriers that um, so people can't view the gate. Um, and then I guess another general comment is we do also have uh, CCTV cameras. We have speakers, fire alarms, fire standpipe systems at all of our stations uh, as well as this one. You can jump to the next slide, Mike. OK, so the next station uh, is the Lele Pawa station, which is located at Honolulu International Airport. And so this station is situated between the international and overseas parking garages. The basic design and functional aspects of this station were developed through coordination with H dot airports. That's uh, Hawaii Department of Transportation Airports section and uh, through community outreach. Um, pedestrian circulation is driven by function and accented with traditional Hawaiian concepts. So the cultural theme at this station was uh, celebrating the Hawaiian traditions of navigation and wayfinding, um, which I found interesting because it is the area that you know everyone travels to and from the island. Uh, so we used there's color paving at the ground level that represents the wayfinding, um, and that's kind of how they did the uh, they did curved patterns with some of the walkways and that sort of thing. That's supposed to kind of be representative of of uh, ocean and wind patterns. And then the colored circular tiles you can't really see it in these pictures, but those are on the ground level and and designed in a way that they are supposed to represent constellations that would aid in the, the Voyager's navigation. Um, some basic elements of the station. So this one, we have two entrances on the ground level, um, kind of on, it's hard to see in these photos, but it's on either side of the, I guess the, the kind of Mauka and Mackay sides uh, on that ground level. There's fair gates that you can access either side. Um, there's uh, the train control room uh, is next to the entrance there, which also has you know our electrical rooms and all that sort of thing. Uh, passengers, so they would they would either enter from the that Malka or Mackay side fair gates, and there's also uh, a third fair gate on the concourse level. So you can see that there's in the picture on the left, you can see that there's a pedestrian bridge that connects to the uh, both of those parking garages. So you can actually access it from either side, and then you would be walking along that ped bridge. And once you turn in towards the station, there is another fare gate there. So um, you would enter through that fare gate, and there's then an elevator uh, that could take you up to the platform level from that concourse area. And then um, from the other side, there's the elevator that takes you all the way up from the ground level. So you could go either to the concourse or the top uh, platform levels. Um, yeah, so there's fairly complex uh, area and uh, a lot of, we, we hit some challenges over here, but it, I think at the end of the day, it's gonna be a really nice station. Um, yeah, so that's kind of all I had for HIA. Let's move over to the next slide, please. So this is Ahua uh, Station. We also call it Lagoon Drive Station. Um, this one is located on the corner of Lagoon Drive and YY Loop. 
Uh, it's in close proximity to kind of a larger industrial area and Kei Lagoon Beach Park, which hosts large events such as like the Outrigger canoe racing and other community events over there. So the cultural theme at this one is we're celebrating the Moana Lua Ahu Pua'a. Although now uh, it's a heavily urbanized area, this land was once a vast flat area that contained three main streams fed from uh, the valleys of Mauka. Uh, culturally, so the the paving patterns, again, like at that ground level, represent the Ahu Pua'a and depict the Moanalua stream extending from the Mauka to the Makai station of the site. Um, the Mauka section is represented by basalt stone with the Makai selection being a lighter colored stone. Um, at each entrance is a paving reference to Alia, Alia Pa'a Kai or the salt ponds uh, as an entry feature. An overriding concentric paving pattern depicts the spreading influence of agriculture and aquaculture. Uh, and then paving and stone material was selected based on the characteristics of the diversity of the Ahupua. The basic station elements, um, the cool thing to point out with this station is, <clears throat> is that we actually don't have a concourse level. So there's no bridge or anything that goes underneath the guideway like our other stations do. Uh, this station is basically has two mirrored uh, entrances on either side of the road there that depending on which way you're traveling, you would just go through there and then up to the platform level uh, through elevator or stair and you'd be at the, the platform to get on the train. Um, and then we did also because uh, as part of a safety requirement, you have to have an emergency egress or, and uh, area from the platform level. There is a emergency staircase that you can see in the rendering on the right side, kind of in that upper right corner uh, that goes down from the end of the platform down to the street level. Um, and then for this one, for this station, our train control room is in the kind of upper left corner, not really pictured here, but that's where our uh, our train control rooms are. And we can jump to the next slide, Mike, please. All right, so this is our fourth and final station of our project. This is Kahau Iki uh, Station. Also, we call it Middle Street Station. Um, so Kahau Iki Station is located on the Makai side of Kamehameha Highway at the Kalihi Intermodal Transit Center. This station allows passengers to have a link from the rail transit to the city bus service. Uh, the cultural theme here is we are celebrating fishing traditions of Mokauea Island. So Mokauea Island is a small island about a half mile from downtown Honolulu, and it's actually one of the two traditional fishing villages left in the entire state of Hawaii. Um, the other being Milo Li'i on the Big Island. So cultural aspects that were incorporated into this station design, we had paving colors at the ground and concourse levels that represent the abundant agricultural and marine resources. Uh, there are bronze pavers that will be installed throughout the ground level entrance and pedestrian bridge. And the pavers depict the various uh, local seaweeds found in the area, providing a source of food. Um, basic station elements, so you can kind of see here in the photo, uh, there is one entrance to the station, which is located at the transit center. Um, so from that side, you would enter into the station through a fare gate. Uh, elevator or stairs that would take you up to the concourse level, which is that pedestrian bridge that you can see going all the way across Kamehameha Highway, or uh, sorry, Kamehameha Highway, and over to the station itself. Um, so from that concourse level, you would then take, there's elevators and stairs that take you up to the two-sided uh, platform level as well. So yeah, that's about it for the four stations overview. Uh, I'll pass it back to Mike to discuss some of the guideway construction. 
Okay, okay so, so how do we, how do we construct, construct the guideway over all these roads and buildings? Well, it's through this as show a picture here of our gantry. This is our our twin beam gantry. And then we do is we precast each of the segments of the span and then hoist it up, put it together, and then we stress, do a final stress, and it becomes a completed span, and then we lower it onto the supports. So uh, the, our typical span is about a 14 segments. As you can see in our casting yard, here's the photograph below in our casting yard. So there's 2,708 segments that make up the 5.1 miles of guideway. And then um, what I'm showing over here is our tallest column is 71 feet. And when our columns range from 71 all the way down to 17 feet. I love sharing this picture because uh, we need, as you can see here, the truck is bringing in one of the segments and you can see that uh, a lot of our constructions at night, so that we're able to close roads, bring the truck in and then raise up each of the individual segments. It's a lot of coordination with getting uh, lean closures and of course, you know, um, noise restrictions and uh, there's a lot of uh, challenges of working at night. Okay, speaking about challenges, so uh, our guideway uh, goes under the flight line of the uh, Honolulu International Airport. And so the picture I show here, yeah, I took uh, from uh, the um, station, looking right down the runway. So one of the design challenges was that we could not be within the envelope of the flight line. And so they had to, and as you look over here on these little stubby columns, like I mentioned before, the tallest column is 71 feet and our shortest is 17 feet. And what they had to do is they had to, well, because it's um, our guideway goes over uh, a road, we have to maintain 16 feet of clearance. And as I show in this picture, our standard um, segment is eight feet, six inches. So that had to be shortened to four feet, six inches in order for us to maintain a roadway clearance of 16 feet. And here's looking on Lagoon Drive and there's Lagoon Station that Joel uh, mentioned over here. So then this is our other gantry, it's a single girder uh, gantry. And uh, if you notice over here, so the design had to be changed. It, th these are the um, shorter segments and they had to build it integral with what we call this as a straddle bent to lower everything as much as we can to make it underneath the flight line and, uh, and, and providing the clearance that we need. And th this was a very complicated um, construction procedure. Yeah, follow. Okay, talking about complicated construction. So I wanted to give you a, a kind of a window into the complexity and, and what effort it takes to build these straddle bins. As you notice, there's a lot of um, false work and we have some temporary towers here. And this is within what Joel mentioned. This is within our industrial area. A lot of uh, commercial truck traffic, and you can see how we would we have to maintain uh, access to all these businesses. And uh, in this case, we had to uh, make this road one way in order to have room um, for our false work. So my uh, our, my hats uh, off to our contractor STG and planning all this, a lot of planning, foresight, and uh, just how they tackle these uh, challenges that they have. All right, for the track work, I'm gonna turn this over to Ryan. Okay, 
Thanks, Mike. Um, tough to follow. We should put these slides in the front. You and Joel are good presenters. All right, the track work, what you see here is the ba uh, basically the status of construction. Um, and broken in the upright is the legend showing our progress. So what you see in blue has incomplete running rail, emergency walkway, and third rail um, attached. But what you see in green on the other end has all of those four items included because the emergency walkway is installed last after the running ra rails and, and third rail. Um, so you can see the overall we're ranging between 70 and 90 percent complete um, with the AGS section for track work. And let's uh, bounce on to the next slide. Yeah. <clears throat> so. Oh, it went backwards. Are we on the. Section of the. Track yet. Yeah, we can see that, Ryan. OK, well, I can't. I know what it looks like, though. So um, anyways, we have 5.2 miles of guideway, which means since we have uh, two sections of track, about 10.3 miles of track. Um, the track, uh, the design is a direct fixation fastener system where the rails are restrained by fasteners that are constructed integrally with longitudinal concrete plinths tied into the guideway deck. And uh, they're fastened every 30 inches or so. So uh, by two different con concrete inserts every 30 inches for 10 miles. So that's a lot of inserts. And the guideway emergency walkway down the middle of the path acts as an emergency egress in the event of any kind of emergency that we need to get people to the nearest station and also a conduit pathway inside of the walkway. On the outside, you see an elevated, what looks like an elevated rail section. That's the electrified third rail that'll carry 750 kV um, and cover board over the over top of that as a safety protection hazard. Uh, this another fun fact about the system. This will be the first autonomous train system. Um, for major transit and this will be a good test to see uh, how it turns out in the end. Uh, next slide, please. OK, we have a couple of special track work items within the AGS section. This is a double crossover, uh, so trains have the ability to switch lanes uh, to perform maintenance or bypass a station. Why not? There's any number of reasons why this might be utilized. Um, that they're very complicated construction, though. There's a lot of additional restrainers that are involved, and there's moving parts called switches at all four corners of uh, the double crossover. And a uh, little bit of complexity involved with um, the third rail components as well, as you can see them jumping from the inside to the outside. The other element of special track work in AGS is the restraining rail. We have two tight curves as we come into the HIA station and it requires additional supporting rail to make sure that, that the rail stays structurally sound on the track. And that's it for special track work and possibly all track. What's the next slide look like? OK, construction challenges. Like I said, uh, building 5.2 miles of guideway within an urban area has many challenges. What I highlighted in this picture is just a, our standard drill rig. And our um, so our columns are supported by a single shaft, and they range from anywhere from 7 feet in diameter to 12 feet in diameter. OK. OK, so here's a overview picture of our tightest curves that our gantries have to navigate on our project. So what you're looking here is um, the Honolulu Airport. And over here is the post office. So as you can see, we come through and we make this pretty sharp turn. Over here, what I mentioned is our tallest column. This is actually the highest part on the guideway. And this was designed to accommodate the largest, I guess, um, aircraft tail fin. So the airport required us to have a, a, a clearance 
that re that resulted in 72 foot high column. So how do we navigate that corner? Well, we do have a gantry that's articulated and it does allow for a certain angle, but unfortunately at this location it, just, it just didn't quite make it. So the contractor had to build a tower to partially support this gantry as it came across. Let me show you this. In addition to that, they had to create a, a temporary support which accommodated access through around this column. So this ended up being a, a double tower, a single tower supported by two towers up here. So as you can see, when the gantry came over, one of the supports landed on the segment, but the other one landed right here on this on this support. It's a creative solution problem. The other um, challenges are is is drilling our shafts. A lot of the shafts hit the water table. The water table is very close to uh, probably an entire range of our project. And so these are called um, cast in place drill holes. Um, and as you can see here, this is uh, we're even uh, having to construct uh, piers with in the streams and within the water. And the the one that said Mill Street Station actually broke a world record. So this is so on our project. We actually uh, constructed the world's deepest drilled shaft single column foundation, and it was 357 feet deep. Picture over here I show is is how we construct them. So there's a steel casing that's constructed and the steel casing prevents collapse. As you imagine, you're drilling uh, a very deep hole, very big hole in um, in a underwater. So uh, to prevent it from collapsing, you're going to have to put in a steel shell. And uh, <clears throat> this machine over here is called an oscillator. So what happens is you, uh, you you place the casing on top, you use this clamshell, remove the material, and then and then this device that's it's sitting on top will oscillate back and forth and place the casing in the hole. And then after after you reach that, you will put the the steel cage and lower it in there. And then, and then after that, you would um, pump the concrete through. And the concrete is heavier than the water. This is called a trimmy, trimmy pour, where you place the concrete in the bottom and it will push the water as the water sits on top of it. As the concrete increases, it will push and move the water out until you completely pour the shaft. OK, so how do you you have a 357 foot hole? That's mostly underwater, so how do you inspect it? It's uh, very important if the shaft and our specs, if it's a uh, friction bearing. The shaft and then you're can only have no more than three inches of loose material at the bottom. If it's a load bearing and bearing shaft, you can you can't have as uh, more than a half inch. So how do you do that? How do you inspect that? So there's a device called a mini SID. And it's what it is, it's a basically um, a little drum there with a camera and the air is trapped in here. So you got a clear view. You place it on the bottom of there and then you view the bottom to make sure that all the debris has been removed. And as you can see here, we, this is called the clean out bucket. And that goes in there and scrapes the bottom and makes sure that all the loose materials were moved. OK, another construction challenge. So the what I've highlighted over here in yellow is the. Pedestrian girder. So in the middle here is our guideway. That's uh, what we construct. So we come by, we construct a. The guideway, then we have to come back for the station. 
in order for you to enter the train, you have these two platforms that need to be constructed on either side. And here on the picture, so th this would be the um, pedestrian girders. So the problem here is how do you construct these pedestrian girders over traffic? Normally, uh, conventionally, you would do a false work from the ground up and support it and the pour the concrete. So here the contractor came a very creative solution. And that is like overhead false work. And what I'm showing you here is if you can all it's uh, the forms for pedestrian girder are actually suspended with a beam on top that is being supported by the guideway. So if you if you picture a person holding two buckets with each bucket being the form for the pedestrian uh, for the uh, girder, that's essentially what you have. And as you can see over here, it's pretty clean. You see the traffic below and there's nothing. So the traffic can freely uh, move below while they constructing the theater. And here's an aerial view of what it looks like when it's all assembled. It's, it's quite a major um, task and uh, complicated uh, design. Over in, in this situation too, since the guideway is supporting the weight, temporary supports were provided when, because this span here is just a little, a little longer uh, than uh, a little longer that the load on the on the girder is going to, uh, to exceed its capacity. So they had to put two temporary towers on that as well. Again, my hats off to SCG of just the planning that is involved to uh, deal with all these challenges. Hey, Mike, I was, can I just add one thing real quick? I don't sure. Interrupt. So yeah, I just want to say going back to your um, your kind of analogy of the the two buckets, they they also had to um, when they were constructing these, they had to you know load the same weight on both sides, so they had to like do like a two pump trucks uh, to start the pours to kind of keep the weight distribution even. So it was challenging um, and and mimicking what Mike said, hats off to the contractor for for getting it done because it was cha a challenge. Yeah, that's a that's another uh, a step of complexity and that, that's right. So what Joel's mentioning is that uh, you cannot because if you imagine it's it's supported in the center, it's, it's teeter tottering. So you couldn't really pour one girder too far ahead of the other girder so that you balance out all the time. You don't so so that the false work wouldn't tilt one way or the other. Yeah, so you have to have two pump trucks and you have to have consistent concrete delivery to make this all work. Thanks, Joe. OK. So we have this beautiful station. This is a Mill Street station. And uh, it's just, uh, you know, it's going to be beautiful views when you go up there and you'll be able to see over the, the Kali stream. But uh, to an engineer's point of view, it's like, this is a big challenge. How do you construct a station over water? Um, and so the, the challenge was there is, is how to stage this, how do you get access over here while you're protecting and and not dropping <laughs> concrete and materials in the water. How do you how do you work around the river? And so what you see here is um, aerial view of Kali Stream passing right through Mill Street Station. So what the contractor did is they had to construct a trestle, as you can see here. And what they did is they put in these temporary pipe piles and they vibrate them into the river and then and then from there build out a platform and you can see this platform over here you can see uh where the oscillators and this is a time when they were placing the shafts and the columns for the guideway and station and so they'll they just to, just to show you the logistics and just the planning you know, of it is a very expensive 
it's timely and then um, it's it's time consuming as well as uh, whatever you put in you're going to have to remove so um, just to take an appreciation for just again planning and making sure everything works you just look at the uh, the, the amount of real estate uh, small amount and how much um, equipment crane you have to plan for crane activity access and so again it's and it shows just the um scg stepping up to that challenge and um they're planning and design efforts and so you can really just appreciate the the challenge of working over over water Okay, the other challenge is utility relocation. And so what I, I, I kind of like this picture because it shows all that uh, dark spots there are, are these are uh, metal plates that are covering over excavation. And as you can see, uh, there's there's a lot of trenching that had to be done, a lot of re, uh, re, utility relocation. And you can imagine that it's all done at night. Um, this is Lagoon Drive, and that's, you know, you can't close Lagoon Drive during the day. So a lot of logistics, a lot of staging. Um, let me show you. So again, this is our uh, project limits. And what I wanted to highlight is that we did, we had some overhead lines over here near um, Pearl Harbor Station. And we, uh, HECO overhead lines, we had some, we had to relocate those. Those are in the way of, of the guideway as we were constructing. And um, these are some other major lines too. And the big thing is that there was a bunch of utilities that had to be relocated. So the sequence, again, like I mentioned on the sequence, um, how we use three gantries so that uh, we'd be able to finish in a timely ma manner, but also, this area was um, sequenced last because there was a tremendous amount of utility relocation. Again, this is the industrial area that had to occur, uh, that had to, the gantry would have to wait. This would be the last section in which the gantry would um, would be assembled when, um, I mean, uh, um, the guideway would be constructed. Um, and so that's a, that was a, a really smart move part of STG. OK, so just the like I said, there was some overhead lines that had to be relocated. Oh, hey, Mike. Hey, Mike, yes. uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, this is Mario. Just giving a time check. You got about 15 minutes left. 15. Oh, yeah, we're almost done. So um, so here's one of the large lines, a lot of logistics with HECO to, to, to remove that. You can see that that it would interfere with the guideway. So it came across. This is the other one over H1, um, these large lines. OK, so when I said utility relocation, I mean a lot of utilities. So I, sh I showed it here a pole. This is a pole just kind of represents the HECO lines, uh, the um, Hawaii Tal, at and it's like everybody's everybody has a utility here on YY loop. Um, and this is the initial area I was talking about. So all these lines you see over here all have to go in the ground. They're, you know, these are manholes and this is a small street, lots of utilities and a lot of effort. You can see over there. Oh, look at that. Mario, you pushed me so fast. Now I'm done. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Thanks uh, uh, to Ryan and Joel as well. Uh, great presentation, guys. Uh, so now uh, we invite anyone that has questions, please uh, let us know. You can either enter it in the chat. Um, I'd be happy to read those out to our presenters, or if you're comfortable to come off mute, uh, please feel free and ask your questions. Uh, there was a question that came in earlier if it's possible uh, to get a copy of some of these photos. Uh, I'll ask uh, the hard public involvement group if that's possible. I can't guarantee it, but I'll ask the question. Any questions out there? 
just while, while we're waiting, if, if someone does come up with a question, I did a quick Google, uh, Mike, um, when you were talking about that, uh, the deepest drill shaft, 357 feet. So the Statue of Liberty from base to tip is 300 feet, 305 actually. So it's like an extra 50 feet deeper than the height of the Statue of Liberty. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, absolutely. It, it was in a, yeah, I know, it, it's an amazing that something, you know, here in Hawaii, you know, we have the deepest uh, foundation shaft in the whole world. That's pretty crazy. Who would have thought? Uh, one question did come through chat. Uh, when will the project be complete and how much will it cost when done? That's probably a Nate question more so than Mike, I guess. If Nate, if you're still around. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'm, we're going to assume you're talking about the entire heart project. So um, recovery plan has been in the news and what the recovery plan is, is basically an assessment of how much funding we currently have and what can we build for that funding and trying to negotiate um, a new uh, federal contract with the FTA uh, to receive their full funding. So uh, right now we've we've gotten that approved through transportation committee at city council. We have one more step getting it approved at full council before we submit it to the FTA for approval. Um, if all of that um, gets approved, of course we've been working hand in hand with everybody. So we expect that it will in some iteration get approved. Um, we would have the FFGA scope be to the civic center station. Um, and then the full scope still remains to Ala Moana. That's still the, the goal of everybody. And it's actually to get to UH Manoa. Uh, but the cost to get to Civic Center Station, including the H2R1 ramp and bus transit center, is $9.1 billion of project costs and approximately uh, $9.8 billion altogether when you include finance costs. Um, and you are correct. The uh, revenue service date schedule for the full alignment is March of 2031, which includes um, our base schedule date of May of 2029. And then you guys are probably familiar with the uh, FTA requirements to do a risk model scenario and have a risk adjusted schedule. And so it's that risk adjusted schedule that gets to March of 2031. So I hope that answered your question. Great, thanks Nate. Uh, I see there's a hand up in the audience, Nikki Dockery, if you had a question, go ahead. Hi, can you hear us? Yes, we hear you. Awesome, thanks for the presentation. This is the team here at Ryder Levitt Bucknell. Um, really interesting with the airport guideway station, it must have been so much different than doing this out in Kapolei, but um, I know there's a lot of stakeholders like the Department of Transportation Airports Division and the Joint Base, obviously, and you won't have that going into downtown um, section, but um, what are some of the other challenges that you foresee or lessons learned from this going into the next section of construction? Okay, I'll take the first stab at that. And then uh, Mike, Joel and Ryan can back me up, kind of fill in the blanks. So uh, the AGS project itself was a huge lessons learned for Hart. Uh, we delivered the guideway and the stations in separate contracts on the west side. Um, it was it was a design build contract for the guideway and track work, but then it was uh, three separate stations station contracts for the nine stations, um, and that interface really hurt Hart because it was Hart's ob obviously the responsibility of Hart to manage that interface uh, ended up costing us a lot of money and delays and things like that. So. Uh, having a design build contract from point A to point B was the lessons learned in itself. It's been very successful. Uh, I do see a question in the chat that asks, how much is this contract worth now? So it was awarded at $875 million. Uh, we're tracking to finish this thing out for under a billion, which is a successful project in the eyes of the FTA because it's, it's within the recommended contingency level. Um, so we learned a lot. The, the biggest challenges going through the city center is of course the uh, dense urban area, the amount of businesses and residents. So traffic control is gonna be a bear. Um, also the amount of utilities is the challenge. Uh, airport had the most utilities to date that we've had to relocate, but we're expecting 
a huge amount of utilities. It, it, we have a utility contract awarded right now to Coluccio for 210 million. We're expecting uh, the award of the next one through Dillingham, which is out on the streets currently to be uh, probably twice that amount. And that's a four year utility relocation project uh, from now until then. So there is a lot of utilities. It's probably, it is the biggest infrastructure utility project this island has seen. So that's the major challenge, just clearing the space to actually allow that uh, design build contractor to come in and repeat what AGS just did. Um, anyone wants to add to that, feel free. Well, I say that, you know, the obvious one is third party utilities, but also the availability of specialty trades. I think the, the labor market, this is very labor intensive, especially for like welding <clears throat> and uh, structural steel erection. I think those are challenges kind of unique to the island, constructing such a, a big complex project. Especially in this environment, construction so good around the nation that um, a lot of contractors, why would I why would I sail across the ocean to build on Oahu when I can grow my business here locally? So it's very tough to compete for those resources here. Uh, we've experienced that to date, especially through AGS, and we're expecting to um, hold that as one of our largest risks as we go into city center. Yeah, and just uh, again, working on an island, a lot of specialty equipment, um, and that's um, there's been delays in fabrication and delivery, and so that's 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 a, a challenge moving to the next project. So I hope that answered your question. If not, feel free to ask again. I also see in the chat from Nick Flores, has COVID been used for justification for delay? If yes, is that considered a compensable delay? So um, many contractors put us on, noted, on notice for potential COVID delays, but COVID or, or this project was always a shovel ready project through COVID. We actually kept the work going predominantly um, through the majority of um, the whole COVID situation. Um, we have incurred additional costs due to like extra uh, stringent safety protocols, uh, quarantining for crews when we were at the height of the quarantine period. So the additional two weeks they had to sit in a hotel room, et cetera. Um, but the majority of critical crews kept working through COVID. Um, there, all, there was also a few minor shutdowns just to make sure COVID didn't um, COVID didn't spread through the project team. So those, you know, had very minimal impacts and we have not awarded any COVID related compensable delays to date. And then also I, I see uh, Biplap, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, but I, I think you're asking, is there any lead accreditation or anything for the building? And uh, Joel or anybody else, we do have lead accreditation or lead certification for our stations, correct? I believe so. I, I, I yeah, I can't say with certainty, but I, I think uh, that is what I had heard. OK, I think I think that is the case. Awesome, great. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left. If there's any other last minute questions, give it just a minute. Doesn't look like it. OK, uh, well, uh, I guess we'll give you a, a handful of minutes back uh, of your day. Uh, once again, thank you to our presenters, uh, Mike, Joel, Ryan and Nate as well. Uh, thank you for participating and joining us today. Everyone have a, a safe and wonderful long weekend uh, and take care. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. I know. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.